is starting to be fall. I'm so excited. Football is here. And more importantly, the Holy Spirit is here with us today. So I'm loving this time of year right now. But glad you guys could be with us. If you don't know me, my name is Sam Ferris. I'm one of the teaching pastors here at Grace. My wife, Sarah, teaches and she's the children's director up here at Grace. So we're just glad to have you guys here. And we're going to finish up the book of 2 Chronicles. This is kind of a short series, but we're kind of running through it. Jeff had the privilege of doing like 35 chapters, and I have part of one. <laughs> but I'm going to really dive deep into that part, and there's a lot to, to unpack here. Again, we're going to see a, a continuation of, of all these kings and the people that have continuously time after time, time after time, trust in themselves and not lean on their father and not lean on God and not trust and put their full devotion into God. And they started out in captivity and they're going to wind up in captivity. But I want to start with saying, it really made me think about profound moments in my life. Like everyone has those profound moments, those times in your life that you never thought would happen or, or they were so unexpected, and it just really sticks with you, like it'll never leave you. I know for me, one that I thought of at a very young age, my great-grandfather, someone I looked up to so much, I never thought anything would ever happen to him. And the day he died, for me, was a very profound moment in my life, because I was old enough to realize what death was, but the significant thing was, is I'd give my life to Jesus like a few days before his death and so that really hit with me so it was a profound moment in my life another one that's probably for a lot of you is 9-11 2001 I remember where I was what I was doing like it was yesterday I know it is like that for for a lot of us fast forward 11 years 9-11 2012 my son Carson was born our son Carson was born profound moment in my life but that's where we're going to see the people of Judah, the people of Israel. They're at this profound moment in their life. They're at a, a crossroads in their life that it's going to completely change. Primarily because of leadership or lack thereof. That they have forgotten their God. They've forgotten the one who gotten them at that place to begin with. So king after king after king came to power. And king after king disobeyed God. That it, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to do what's best for me. It's all about me. And they forget about God. But all they had to do was submit and be spared. God said, you can have all this stuff. You're out of captivity. You're, you're my people. I ask that you worship me only. Submit to me. No other gods or goddesses. Submit to me and you will be spared. Submit to me, and you'll have success. So the title of today's message is Submit and Be Spared. And I like how it's like a road sign. I went to Florida one time, and it said, do you think it's hot here, God? So, <laughs> submit and be spared. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for being here in our presence today, Father. Just speak to us today. Just Open our hearts to your word. Help us understand what you're trying to tell us. Father, that we're going to take what you're going to give to us and we're going to take it out there to the world. Father, we thank you for being here today. Father, just spread this room with your Holy Spirit. Open our hearts, open our minds to your truths. We lift up everyone in here today, Father. You know what they're going through. You know what I'm going through. Father, we just turn it all over to you today. We love you and we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. So submit and be spared. Submit to me or it's not going to turn out very well for you. And it's not going to turn out well for the people. It's not going to turn out well for the kings because they would not submit. Even, even the so-called good kings, like Jeff listed them all up here the other day, even the so-called good kings... They didn't get it right. They still failed at times. But king after king, they didn't follow God's plan. They thought that 
their way was better than his way. But all they had to do was submit and they would be spared. For the people, they were no different. Because they were following the leadership of their king. Well, the king's not worshiping God. Why should I? The king's worried about himself. I'm going to worry about myself. They were just following the examples that were set before them. My way is better. I've got this under control. I can solve this problem. All I need is a better job. All I need is a little bit more money. I'm just going to put all these other gods and goddesses up on my mantle and cover all my bases. Because if this is going wrong, I'm just going to worship over here. If this is going bad, I'm just going to turn to that over there. And they get further and further away. And God said, just submit to me and be spared. But they turned their backs on God. They turned their backs on him. And just like Jeff said last week, God will eventually turn you, us over to our sins if that's what our heart desires. The people are no different. They, they did not desire God. They didn't submit to God. So he's going to turn them over. He's going to say, I've had enough. And that's where we're going to find the nation of Israel today. Second Chronicles chapter 36. We're going to start in verse 11. That the people have turned their backs on God. That the people that were in captivity, that were wanting out of Egypt and God led them out, were once again going to be put right back where they started in captivity. Verse 11, Zedekiah was 21 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. Shocker. He did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet, who spoke from the mouth of the Lord. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who made him swear by God. So at this time, the Egyptians came upon them. They took them over. They took them captive. Kings were put in bondage. And so the people, were they, they were like this vassal nation. They were not their own. They were being run by the Egyptians. And now King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon is coming on the people. And he's going to run things for a little while. This pagan king. He stiffened his neck and hardened his heart against turning to the Lord, the God of Israel. And all the officers of the priests and the people likewise were exceedingly unfaithful, following all the abominations of the nations, and they polluted the house of the Lord that he had made holy in Jerusalem. The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers, because he had compassion. He had compassion on his people, these people that continuously turned their backs to him, he still had compassion for them and his dwelling place. But verse 16, but they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people until there was no remedy. There's no remedy no one likes to hear that. If you've got an illness and they're like, no, there's no remedy for that. There's no remedy. The people were so far gone. There was no remedy. God sent messenger after messenger to the people. Submit to God. Turn to God. But yet they scoffed at them. The same thing happens today. You probably have people that you're witnessing to. You probably have people in your life that you're trying to lead to Christ, and they're scoffing at you. They're disagreeing with you. They don't believe in God. The same thing happens. The same thing has happened. So they were in captivity. Now they're in captivity again. So in these verses, we see a people that were brought out of captivity. And all they had to do was submit. All they had to do was submit to one true king, the one true God, and they couldn't do it. They thought their ways were better. So at this point, they, they lost their land. They lost their homes. They lost their identity. They lost their temple. Everything was taken out of the temple. Nebuchadnezzar took everything out of the temple tore it down so their city was lost, their temple was lost, and God turned them over. 
what their hearts wanted, he turned it over to them. They were more interested in self-gain. They were more interested in power. They were more interested in success instead of trusting God. The nation turned their backs on God time after time. And he still had compassion on them. He sent messenger after messenger. He sent Jeremiah the prophet and he's preaching to the people. He's preaching to all these kings and they're turning their backs to him. You want to be in exile? Here's exile. And most of this was due to pride. See, in our lives we have to listen to the warnings. We have to listen to the people that God puts in front of us. They're telling us, hey, you're not living up to your standard. Hey, you're not doing this right. Maybe you should try it this way. Hey, I'm praying for you. But we turn, his, we turn our backs to him. But I want to look at Jeremiah for a second. Because Jeremiah was this great prophet. Yet he wasn't very successful. He was doing the work of God. He was, he was delivering God's message to the people. He was doing what God called him to do, yet he had very little success. His people were put into exile. Kings would not listen to him. They would not fully submit. And a lot of times in our ministry, we get tied up and we get so concerned and so focused on our success about making it that we forget God. But see, God doesn't call us for our success. He doesn't call us for our trophies. He doesn't call us for the great things that we're going to do. He calls us for our yes. He wants us to submit to him. And when he lays something on our hearts to do, when he gives us a calling, all he wants is our yes. I'll never forget when Dennis told us that we were going to have a rotating pulpit and I was going to be one of the team. I was like, no, uh <laughs> Jeff was like, no way, that's not going to be us. God, I'll do anything with that. God is not concerned with success. He wants our yes. See, Jeremiah was faithful, and he said, yes, I will do that, even though the success wasn't there for him. His entire nation turned their backs to the one true king. He was not very successful, but he had a yes. He said yes to God. See, he's wanting our service. He's wanting our humility. See, it said he would not humble himself. Zedekiah, all he had to do was humble himself and submit, and he would not. He did not. Zedekiah, you want to rule? You want to have power? You want to have success? You want to have a nation? Then submit to me. He wouldn't do it. See, just because we're called doesn't mean we're going to have success. We're not always going to have success in our ministry. You're going to have people that, that you have in your life that you've been praying for that time after time after time. You're just going to them over and over and over again. And you don't see the success. You don't see the victory. But God sees your yes. He sees your yes. But he wants us to submit with humility to our calling. Even if we don't see success, he wants our humility. See, Jeremiah was a prophet for over 40 years. He had very little success, but he still persisted in God's calling on his life. You see, the same thing is happening today. We won't always have a winning record. We won't always make, do it, make it right. We won't always do the right things. But if we humble ourselves to his calling... He sees our yes. And Jesus gives us the perfect example of this when he bows down and washes his disciples' feet. He got, it's the lowest of the lowest things that a servant could do is wash the feet of the people as they come in. Yet, when Jesus is washing the disciples' feet, you know, it was a, it was a profound moment in their lives. It was a profound moment that God himself was bowing to them and washing their feet, humbling himself, washing their feet. But even more so is the people that were walking by. Turned, wait, he's supposed to be the Messiah? He's supposed to be the king? He's claiming to be all these things, but yet he is washing 
their feet? That's humility. Jesus is showing us how to serve. That's a yes. I will bow down and I will wash their feet. I will lower myself and not worry about success. That's humility. Humility matters. And humility is just confidence in God alone. It's our full confidence in him. Humility is completely trusting God and and not ourselves. We forget that. Kings forget that. Leaders forget that. And our leadership matters. Our leadership truly matters. See, we're, we're all called to be leaders. Not all everyone wants to be a leader. You, and you're in school, you do. Everybody fights to be the leader, even though, even though they get to the same place at the same time. Everyone fights to be the leader. They cry over it. And they're like, oh, you can be the boost. I don't want to be the caboose. Like you're all going to the same place at the same time. But we're all called to be leaders in our, in our jobs, in our families. No matter where we go, we are called with a great commission to go and tell the world. To go and spread the gospel no matter if you get scoffed at or no matter if you have success. God is looking for your yes. God is looking for your yes. See, our, that leadership matters. See, these kings, they were unsuccessful because they did not set the tone. You have to set the tone wherever you're at because leadership matters. That's why there were so many bad kings because, hey, that looks fun. I'll try that. And the next king was bad. The next king was bad. And then we'd have a great king. We'd have a good king like Josiah and then his own son. Joachim was bad. And then his son was bad. See, leadership matters. They were, they were bad. Set the tone wherever you're at. I'll never forget, we were, I took a football team to a, a jamboree, so we, we traveled. And it was probably one of the first times they had ever traveled for a football game. And so I didn't know where to go. I didn't, so, and I was a little nervous myself. I know they were nervous. And I said, okay, guys, wait here. Just real simple instructions. Wait here with your stuff. I'm going to go find I'm going to go find out where we need to go and where we're going to set up. I'm like, okay. I told like, just, just stay here. So I turn and I walk away. And I took about 15 steps maybe and I turn around and the entire football team is behind me. I was like, no. <laughs> but see, I thought about that for a second because they weren't just doing what I asked them to do. They might have not understood my directions, but they were following me. They were following me. And see, when Jesus told his, his disciples, hey, drop your stuff and follow me, they, they might not have understood what they were doing, but they followed him. He, he wants the same thing for us. We may not understand what he's calling us to do, but when he says, hey, follow me, say yes. When he says, hey, I want you to do this, say yes. Say yes. He's wanting our yes. But we, we look for success. But see, a humble leader develops those around them they may not listen to what you say but your actions are much more louder than words that's like with with Carson you know he may not listen all the time or he may not say all the same things I say but when he acts like me in the good ways and the bad and, and the bad ways that's more significant is it not That they're following you. See, we have to be more like Jesus. We have to follow him. Humble ourselves. See, in most churches we look for success. Right? We have very little empty seats in here this morning. Second service, we we really don't know what's going on. But it's kind of dropping a little bit. It made me think that it's really not about, it's really not about the seats. It's about the ending. It's about the ending. Because what are we doing with those people in the seats? What are other churches doing with the people in the seats? Because it's, the ending is much more important. So are we pouring out in churches like we should? Or are we, are, are we focused more on quantity than we are quality? See, it's the ending that matters. It's the ending that matters, not the success. But the people that we're leading, it's about their ending. 
stay persistent. Their eternity is where we find success. See, our discipleship matters. Who are you talking to? How are you talking to them? Who are you walking with? See, discipleship matters. How's your talk? That's all tied into leadership. See, for most of these kings, they refused God time after time until it was too late. They refused their calling until there was no remedy. There was no remedy. So it was time for rest and it was a time to heal. Verse 17. It says, therefore, he brought up against them the king of the Chaldeans, who killed their young men with a sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion on young man or virgin, old man or aged. God turned them over. Most of the people were wiped out. He gave them all unto this hand. And all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king and his princes, all these he brought to Babylon. And they burned the house of God and broke down the wall of Jerusalem and burned all its palaces with fire and destroyed all its precious vessels. He took them into exile in Babylon, those who had escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him and to his sons until the establishment of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. Until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths, all of the late days it lay desolate. It kept its Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. See, we see pride comes before the fall. Now we see the fall. Without God, a nation dies. A city dies. They are put back into slavery right where they started. God led them to the promised land. They turned their backs on him, and now they're in exile once again. You know they had to be like, where is God? Why, why, did, why, did, he, why did he leave? Why did he let this happen? He sp- we're supposed to be his people. What happened? Submit and be spared. Where is God? And from our view, we may be like that sometimes too. I'm going, I'm going through this. God, where, where are you? Why did, why did you leave me? Maybe you've turned your back on him. They became too confident. They became too proud. See, they were, they were lost in the pursuit of success. They were lost in the pursuit of personal gain. They were lost in the pursuit of power. They were lost in the pursuit of worldly things. And they forgot God totally. See, sometimes we can turn our backs on God for so long that we find ourselves in exile as well. That we find ourselves in that dry, desolate place. Wondering where God is. See, our God is is kind. He's compassionate. He's persistent. He's patient. But he's also just. He's also just. And see, we, we like to forget about that last part for as people. We like to forget that our God judges us. See, God will always look to help us, to guide us, to teach us. But we cannot continue to turn our backs on him. We cannot continue not to obey his calling on our life. We cannot continue to keep saying no when he's wanting our yes. So we can't continue to turn our backs to God and not expect consequences in our life. Now, I was thinking about consequences. I like to consider myself, I was a, a, a pretty good kid growing up. I didn't get in too much trouble. I only got a few paddlings in school. I deserved every one of them. And uh, it wasn't that many, but those are few. I had my last one in high school, believe it or not. That would not fly today, but me and my friends, we were in, a, in an ag class. I think it was small animal care. And... Uh, 
one of my favorite teachers ever uh, was, was our teacher. And me and my friend, we were always goofing off in there. And he would always send us off to do errands and, you know, if something needs fixed, and we'd go in the shop and fix it. If something needs, you know, we were hardly ever in their classroom. And uh, so we got a little bit comfortable. We got a little bit comfortable. We're like, oh. We so he gave us this assignment one day. We don't ever do assignments. So we're just back there goofing. Everybody else is doing the work. And we're just back there goofing off because, oh, he's not going to do anything to us. Until I found myself into the shop and he had his paddle. And we were still laughing up until the point that, that the paddle was touching skin. We thought he was joking because he would never, ever get on to us. See, we can't continue to keep doing the same things to our Heavenly Father and not expect some consequences. And that's what we did. We abused that privilege. And we do the same thing in our own lives. Oh, God's not going to punish me. There will be judgment. See, Judah was suffering the consequences of pride and an unrepentant heart. This beautiful city, God's city, God's temple was in ruins. All the all the treasure and all the, all the nice things were in Babylon now. The people were wiped out. There was only a small remnant of people, and they were back in exile. They were back where they started, just in a different location. It was ransacked. It was destroyed. And see, all these things were prophesied to happen. They said, submit or be doomed. Submit. And be spared. But yet they turn their backs. Not, nah. We don't ever have to do work. We won't ever get paddled. Oh yeah, you, you will. And they did. They were put into exile. God said, if you want this, I'm going to turn it over to you. All these things were prophesied to happen. Jeremiah warned them time and time again. And they kept turning their backs. They kept turning their backs until it was too late. They did not heed the warnings. See, one of the things, they were supposed to let the land rest for seven years. They were supposed to farm for six and let it rest for seven. Farm six, rest for seven. And they got comfortable. Oh, let's just farm all seven. Farm all seven. So he's like, okay, I'm taking my land back. And then some. So it could have its rest. So it could have its Sabbaths. And I really think that he's telling us the same thing. That sometimes we just need to rest. And I'm not talking about sitting on your couch and watching TV. Sitting on your couch and reading a book. Rest. Rest. And that means just sitting down and meditating on his word. Just talking to him. Rest. When things get loud. When things get crazy. When things seem like they're falling apart. Rest. Take your Sabbath. Take your Sabbath. See, it's a lesson of tough love. So we need lessons of tough love every once in a while. They ignored prophets. They ignored God's word. See, they were in exile, but they were not totally abandoned. If, if, you know, after all of this, they were in exile, but they were not totally abandoned. See, God saved a remnant of people. There was just some survivors left, probably not the strongest people, but people nonetheless. They were not forgotten. Let's see how it ends right here, verse 22 and 23. It says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus the king of Persia. The Lord the God of heaven. Has given me kingdoms of this earth. And has charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem. Which is in Judah. Whoever is among you. Of all his people. So hey all of you that are in exile. You get to go back. The Lord told me to let you go. I'm going to submit and be spared. Go back. 
Whoever is among you of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. See, even in exile, God keeps his promises. He keeps his blessings and judgment. So even in exile, you may be feeling right now today that you're in this desert place that you feel all alone. That you feel like that all hope is lost. You feel like nothing is working out. You don't feel God in your life. You may be in exile today, but he is still there. That God keeps his promises. He keeps his promises for your life. Even though you may not see it, the blessings are going to be there. See, God uses Cyrus, a pagan king, to send his people home after 70 years of exile. After the land rested, they were sent home to rebuild, to replenish, to submit, and be spared. See, this nation, it was stripped to the foundation. It was completely wiped off its foundation. But see, there was a greater foundation that it was built upon. It was God. So these buildings could be wiped away and rebuilt again, but God was their foundation. See, everything may have seemed stripped away. Everything may seem stripped away in your own life. That you feel like your temple is broken down. That you feel like your city is wiped out. That nothing is going right. But God is your foundation. His blessings are are there for you. For them and us, our own remedy, our only true remedy for our life is Jesus. It's the, he's the only remedy. He is the only cure. He's the only cure for our hearts. He's the only cure for nations. He's the only cure for this world. Jesus is the only remedy. So when there is no remedy, Jesus is the remedy for the world. See, for the world, a new king would be coming. And they prayed year after year after year that a new king, their Messiah, would come and take and fix everything that was wrong. That they would spare them from, from Rome and all the oppression that years later that they would go through. They were waiting on this king. But see, he didn't come just to, to free a few captives. He didn't come just to save a nation. He came to save the world. In John 12, it says the next day the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming. Sitting on a donkey's colt. Your king is coming. Our king is coming back to get us one day. Our king is coming back to heal our land once and for all. The one true king will be coming back. See, Jesus was arriving to bring peace, but not just between Jews and Gentiles, not but just between the Jews and the Romans. He was bringing peace to the entire world. He was going to do what no other king could do. So the temple would be rebuilt, but now the king comes to dwell and tabernacle with us. Those temples that were, that were tore down, we are his temple. He tabernacles with us. His Holy Spirit is in us. See, even in exile, even in this broken, messed up world, he tabernacles with us. That we serve the one true king. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. All these kings, the good and the bad, they never measured up. And they all died. And someone else took their place and he died. Someone took his place and he died. Good kings and bad kings. But Jesus is the king of the world who died so that we could live. See, he was more, he's more concerned with our eternity than he is our comfort here on earth. He's more interested in our eternity than he is our success. Right now, all he's looking for is our yes. Because if we say yes to him and we submit to him, we will be spared. Submit to him. 
Say yes to him. So if you're here today and you never said yes to him, and he is not your king, submit today and you will be spared. You will be spared. So in closing, I want to live my life more like these three people. Because we're talking about Babylon and King Nebuchadnezzar. Maybe you remember the story of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Time and time again, Nebuchadnezzar says, bow before my gods. Bow before my statues. Like, we're not going to do it. Everyone else may bow, but we will not bow. So we would rather die. That our God would be with us. That we are confident that our Heavenly Father will be with us no matter where we go. Even if you put us in the fiery furnace, our God will be with us. And even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't, we would rather die than to bow down to your gods. That's how we should humble ourselves. That's how I want my life to be. I would rather die than not submit to him. That than not to say no to his calling on our life. Submit to him and be spared. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for all your many blessings. We thank you for being in our presence today. Father, if there's anyone here today that does not know you as their Savior, as their Lord, as their one true King, Father, today all they have to do is ask with a repentant heart, all they have to do is submit to your calling on their life. Say, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me for my sins. Be Lord over my life. That I turn everything over to you. That I submit to you, Jesus. That I believe that you rose on the third day after being killed on the cross for my sins, for my transgressions, for my failures. Jesus, save me today. Be king of my life. If you say those words, you will be spared. Your eternity is secure. Our Heavenly Father loves us that much. Father, we thank you. We thank you for being in our presence today and being in our midst. We love you. We thank you. In your name we pray. Amen.